and your master's wives to your arms. I gave you all of Israel and Judah, and all this had been too little. If it were, I would have given you more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says, out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity on you before your very eyes. I will take your wives and give them to someone who is close to you. And he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all of Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. These next few verses as you read them through, and I want to challenge you to read them through over over the rest of the day. Sit down sometime and read the rest of this passage. We're going to walk through it a little bit. But I want to challenge you to look at how God disciplines us in sin and how we can respond to God's discipline and come out as a man or a woman of God. Now, after a tough exam, two college roommates headed to the, to the campus uh, tavern to have a few beers and relax. Hang on, it's not that bad of a story. When they parked the car, the rider pointed out a sign that prohibited parking in that area. Now, this particular friend was in the habit of having to help his friend pay for all his parking tickets. And so he was a little ticked off. But his friend looked at him and said, don't worry, I won't be getting any more tickets ever again. And the friend said, how do you figure that? And the other one retorted sarcastically. He said, well, I've looked into the problem scientifically. I've collected all the variables. I've studied the data and came up with a solution that will eliminate any further encounters with the law. And as he walked away, he added, I took the windshield wipers off the car classic example of how we attempt to deal with our sin. And folks, I want to confront you with that today as I confront myself with it as well. Quite often we go right on sinning, but we try to skirt around the consequences of sin, and instead of dealing with the real problem, we work overtime at inventing ways to get away with it to make it look like we never did anything wrong. While that may work in some cases of the law of our land, it never, never never works when we violate the law of God because God disciplines those he loves. You see, David tried to cover up his sin with Bathsheba, but he encountered one inescapable flaw. The thing that David had done was evil in whose sight? It says in Scripture it was evil in the sight of the Lord. You see, David hadn't written written. Hebrews 4.13 yet. And it wasn't written just yet, to be fair, but if you have your Bibles, turn open to Hebrews 4.13 with me real quick. We're not going to throw that one up for you, uh, but turn with me to it. The book of Hebrews, clear back in the New Testament, the fourth chapter, the 13th verse, and it says this. I want you to hide this one in your heart, right? Because this is a little bit scary, but yet... If you understand God's grace and his love and his justice, you can come to terms with this. It says this, nothing in all creation, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. That's okay, right? God sees everything. God, you're the man. You see everything. Just let's just keep it between us, bro. Just you and me, a couple of dudes here, we're just hanging out, right? Between you and me. No, that's not what it says. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Woo. So in this passage of scripture, we find that God lets David stew in his guilt for nine months to a year. And then he sends Nathan the prophet to confront David and he tells him a parable. Isn't that interesting? Somebody else in Scripture told parables, didn't they? 
And Nathan tells David this parable about a rich man that steals a poor man's lamb to serve his guests for dinner. And David flies off the handle and, and he judges that man. And then Nathan springs it on David, telling him he is the guilty one. And we can look at this as an example today as a way that we who are holy can confront someone with sin. But then we'd run into the problem and the risk of missing the greater lesson here. The greater lesson here is not how do we confront somebody else in a clever way with their sin, but how do we respond to God recognizing we too have sin? And how do we receive God's discipline in the process and live to tell about it? You see, God makes a provision for us to experience victory over sin, right, through Jesus Christ. We can experience victory over sin. And yet we still find ourselves falling prey to it, don't we? Anybody in here? Have you overcome all the sin in your life? Stand up and testify. Come up and preach because I, I ain't worthy. You see, God makes that provision, but we still fall prey to its temptation. And it becomes important to us to learn how to deal with sin God's way. Did you catch that? If you have sin in your life, don't go find a counselor. Don't go find somebody else. Deal with God and his truth in your life. Now, I'm not saying don't go seek out counseling at all. Don't think that's what I'm saying. You know, there, there's good times to talk to friends. In fact, we're called in Scripture sometimes to confess our sins to each other. But make sure that everything you do in your life is balanced with the truth in the Word of God. I want you to think about that. It becomes important to learn to deal with sin in God's way so we can restore a relationship with God. And then it, what is, something is incredible that can happen from that. When we, when we restore that relationship with God, then we can grow in His grace. There came a point in my life where I had to learn just how important God's grace was to me. More important than the picture of me looking like, like a good, honest, holy preacher man. You see, I need God's grace. And that's the point of God's discipline in our lives. And David's response to Nathan's rebuke and God's discipline is an example we can take to heart. Here it is. Start with honest confession. All right? You start. Really. No, really. You go first and then I'll come in. I'll chime in later. Who wants to start? Anybody? Let's talk about it a little bit first. Since Adam and Eve fell into sin, there has been an innate tendency in the human heart to attempt to cover our sin. Think about it, right? What's the first thing that Adam and Eve did when they figured out they had sinned against God? What they do? Yes, but before that, yeah, they got some fig leaves and started covering themselves up. It's really interesting, isn't it? Sin results in guilt and estrangement from God, and then they hide from God, and they hide from our fellow man. Our sin embarrasses us, and so we try, just like Adam and Eve did, to put our fig leaves in place to cover our sin. And there are various types of fig leaves that we can use to cover our sin. And we attempt to hide from God, and we attempt to hide from one another. I want you to look at the verse Jeremiah 17 9. Jeremiah 17, 9. I think we have it up on the screen for you, too. It says this. Recognize this. When you try to hide and cover your sin, there's a reason for that. It says your heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? When sin creeps in and we decide to replace God and become our own God instead, our heart becomes deceitful. And guess who's the first person we try to deceive, usually? You want to guess? Who? Ourselves. We try to, we try to, we try to say, hey, it's not so bad. I, I'm not such a bad person. Really, I'm not. And the person who covers sin instead of confessing 
is also oftentimes judgmental of the same or lesser sins in others. It's an easy switch and bait game, isn't it? To say, well, maybe I've sinned, but I saw you sin the other day too. And then we don't deal with our own sin. In fact, we begin pointing out many other sins that we can find around us just to lessen the degree of shame in our own life, and it doesn't work. David's harsh reaction to the rich man in Nathan's parable was amazing. He said, this guy deserves to die, even though the law of God in Exodus said, all you got to do in this case is repay the man four times. The rich man could have done that easily. It wouldn't have hardly cost him anything except for his personal pride and honesty. Even though David didn't yet realize it, the rich man in Nathan's parable confronted David. And David's angry response was to attack the man. Sometimes we attack our confronters who are honestly trying to help us. And we apply the law in reverse to others and not to ourselves. And that's, that's the whole denigration of sin that it causes. And things begin to fall apart all around us. The man who stole a lamb deserves to die. What about an adulterer and a murderer? See, Matthew 7th chapter, the 5th verse says, First, take the law, the plank or the log out of your own eye. And then you'll be able to see clearly enough to remove the speck from your brother's eye. But we fight so hard trying to pretend that there's nothing in our eye. We're often like the college student who was filling out a questionnaire to help determine roommate compatibility. Any of you remember doing that when you were going to college? You fill out this little question, they ask you certain things, and, uh, and some of you didn't go to college, you were much smarter than that, I understand that. Questions like, do you make your bed regularly, and do you, con do you consider yourself a neat person? And this young man checked yes on both those boxes, and his mother was looking over his shoulder, and knowing that they were far from the truth, asked why he had lied. He said, what? And have them stick me with some slob? You see, sometimes we like to rationalize our own sin. And David did this when he sent word to Joab. After Uriah died, you know what David's response was? Well, the sword devours one as well as the others. Sad. You see what sin causes? It, it causes a deadening of, the, deadening of the whole person to life around them. And the only thing that matters is self-preservation. In other words, that's the way it goes. I'm not responsible for this. It must be God's fault. We rationalize when we make up excuses to absolve us of personal responsibility for our sin. Sometimes we, we even tend to blame others or God. And David, fortunately in this passage of Scripture, he didn't use this one as far as the text reveals, but I include it because it's so common. <laughs> you know who Adam blamed for the fruit incident? You gave me that woman, and she deceived me. And, and then he blame, Eve blames the Lord who gave Eve, and he blames the serpent, and everybody gets blamed. And we've been involved in the blame game ever since. Whose fault is it that gas prices are so high anyway? Don't even say it. Don't even say it. You see, it's so easy to get involved in that game, isn't it? And it's such a game. It's such a game of humanity. It's pointing and fixating on other things so we don't have to deal with ourselves. But if you're blaming, you're not confessing. Whatever the fig leaf you use, covering our sin is not confessing it. And the beautiful thing in this passage of Scripture that David does when he hears this whole story after he gets anger and he angry and he breathes in and breathes out, in verse 13 he says, I, I, I have sinned against the Lord. I have sinned against the Lord, David says. In Psalm 32, David pours out his heart 
following this confession. And he says this in Psalm 32, 5, Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and you did not cover up my iniquity. That's not an accusation, that's a realization. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and this is what David realized. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. The word confess used in that verse means to make known or to declare. You see, God's method is not to hide sin. And I want you to understand this today, and it's a scary reality. God's method message is that we don't hide sin, but we expose it. Thus, to confess our sin means to admit it and to expose it openly before God and usually before those that we have wronged. For confession to be genuine, there has to be three elements as we see in this passage of Scripture. And the first one is accepting full responsibility for my sin. We get so involved in blaming others that this at some point becomes impossible. Because we're so consumed with the web we've woven. But David confesses his sin and he agrees with God that he is a sinner. He doesn't backtrack to everybody else and everything else. He just says to God, I have sinned against the Lord. Sin, let me spell this out for you. It, this, this gets a little ugly, and this is why we're waiting to have communion until a little later in worship, because I think this is a day for us all to examine ourselves in light of what's going on in the world. You see, Sin at its heart is despising God and his word. Well, that's a hard thing to say. Because I want you to know that I'm not just talking to you, but the things you're playing with, the sin that you're playing with that you think nobody knows about, God knows. And it separates you from a relationship with you, and and it creates all sorts of despicable things in your relationships around you. And God says, Listen, sin is serious enough to separate us from his holy presence. And that's why he took such a drastic solution in sending his own son to die for our sin. So what do we do? Maybe today, for the first time in a long time, maybe today... We invite you to apply the blood of Jesus Christ to your sin. Only God can forgive your sin. And that only on the basis of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9.22 quoted this one yesterday while we were, um, while we were uh, working on some deer. Remember that, Eddie? I, I, I wasn't even being prophetic at that moment. It just kind of came out of my mouth. But uh, we had been processing some deer. And we ground up this meat, and we put it in a big, a big tub. And after we got taking all that wonderful deer meat out and making it into about 30 logs, <laughs> wasn't it 30, Eddie, Ed? About 30 logs of, of deer sausage. That's, that's why he's sitting down today and I'm hanging onto the pulpit, because that was a lot of work. We got all done, and we're all kind of tired and looking at each other, and we realize that we got to take, take out the bottom of this, uh, this bottom of this vat is just full of blood. And, it, you know, it hit me going outside, and I really wasn't even thinking about the sermon today, but Scripture says this, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Now, I was being a little cute, and I was saying, without the shedding of blood, I don't get to eat deer meat. But that's a bit facetious for what we're talking about right now, isn't it? No joke. No making it light. God sent his only son to deal with your sin and with mine. He knows what it is to lose somebody that's very, very close to you through death and ugly death in this world. He knows the price of sin full well in our broken world, and he makes a way. He makes a way for you and me to experience eternal life, perfect life. 
God has once and for all reconciled you to himself through the cross. But when you sin, subsequent to salvation, in order to experience God's forgiveness and to enjoy fellowship with him, you have to apply the blood of Christ by confessing your sin. And it's best to keep short accounts with God. You know what I mean? The instant you're aware of sin, whether thought or word or deed, let me invite you to simply do what it's taken me a lifetime to learn to do. Turn from it and confess it to him so you can enjoy renewed cleansing and communion with the holy and gracious Father. <laughs> but confession is only part of the matter, and many people don't understand God's ob holy opposition to all sin. No matter how big, no matter how small, no matter if you think you got away with it, God opposes all sin. And so we expect there to be no consequences once we've confessed our sin. But if confession is genuine, we will submit to God and his dealings with us. And so I want to invite you today to submit to God as he deals with you, or it'll never be over. From our human perspective, we would think that God would have tried to cover David's sin, right? I mean, after all, David is God's holy man. David is God's king chosen to rule over his people. And you think that God spent a moment trying to cover up David's sin from public view? After all, this was the man of God's own heart. This was the anointed king over his chosen people. It makes God look bad, doesn't it? If the word leaks out that God's man has done such a thing. But God's way is not to cover sin, but to expose it. And God uses discipline to remind us that he is both a just and loving God. And I want you to capture that and take it home with you. And the question is, will you respond like David? David wrote that psalm in, in the 32nd psalm, but he also wrote another one in Psalm 51 in response to this situation. And he says this, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And David says this, because life's about to get tough for David. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. In other words, David says, God, I'm willing to accept your discipline. Wow. Wow. I want to remind you that there is a New Testament law that we find in the book of Galatians. It's called the law of sowing and reaping. It's included in this epistle that was written to defend God's grace and so it's consistent with God's grace, and it applies to those under God's grace, that God is gracious, although sometimes severe, when he impresses upon us the severity and the nature of our sin. It's seen when a loving parent whose teenager irresponsibly crashes the family car. Did that. My dad walks into my bedroom and I was hiding under my covers and he says, son, son, let's, let's, uh, let's go take care of this thing that you did. You see, because I didn't just damage his car, I swerved off the road because I was falling asleep after a long day or two days of, of fun and enjoyment pleasing myself and I swerve off and I crashed through this gate. This guy had sheep and I crashed through his gate in front of his driveway. He had set these telephone poles in as posts for this gate, and so they didn't move, but the gate just literally exploded. And uh, I guess as we went to the man's house, we had caused some other chaos as well because the sheep didn't handle, didn't handle that explosion very well either, and they were all over the place. Anybody got sheep? They're funny creatures, aren't they? These sheep were running all over the place and bouncing off things they had never bounced off before. Not off my vehicle, fortunately, but they were just going crazy. And we walk over to this guy, and this guy is literally freaking out. And my dad says, hey, we've come back to help. And the guy looks at my dad like he was nuts. And the rest of that evening, into the night, we spent helping him get his sheep back in, helping him repair his gate. My dad taught me a valuable lesson that 
that you deal with things right up front. And you don't freak out over it, but you deal with it. And then you work really hard for a long time to help pay for the car. <laughs> there are consequences. There are consequences. There's forgiveness and there's fellowship, but there are consequences. And it teaches us an important lesson in Galatians, the sixth chapter, verses seven through eight. It says, do not be deceived. You can fool everybody else, and maybe you are, but God cannot be mocked. We reap what we sow. Whoever sows to please their own flesh, to look good in the eyes of the others, to make sure that everybody knows that the world is unjust, But whoever sows to please the flesh will reap destruction. And whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap, what's the word there? Eternal life. What do you want? It's a question, isn't it? Destruction or eternal life? You don't have to come clean with me. I'm not your priest. I'm just a pastor. But would you submit to God as he deals with you? Because there's something much larger at stake than our personal pride. The crucial question here is how to respond when God deals with you in the aftermath of your sin. Do you shake your fist in God's face and exclaim it's not fair? Do you point and say, see if I ever serve God again? And David's response in this passage of Scripture is amazing. If you look down farther in the passage of Scripture, we see that his infant son has just been born with Bathsheba, it's not very old. His son dies as a direct result of David's sin. But instead of maligning God, David grows up, picks himself up, cleans himself up, and he worships God. That's the opportunity today. He said, in effect, in this passage of Scripture, and I invite you to read the rest of it today, you are God and your ways are right. If my affliction vindicates your holiness and can be used to impress upon others the serious nature of sin, so be it. I submit to your dealings with me. And if you don't think my knees are shaking that, saying that right now and right here, you've got another thing coming. As we think about this whole area of sin, it is serious to God. So much so that the world is crumbling under its weight. Can you see it and do you care? It's costing lives. A little boy was visiting his grandparents. And he was given his uh, first slingshot. He had great fun playing with it in the woods, and he would take aim and let a stone fly, but he never hit a thing. And then on his way home for lunch, he cut through the backyard and saw his grandmother's pet duck. You're way ahead of me. Have you heard this story before? He, let the, he took aim and he let the stove, sno, stone fly. It went straight to the mark, and to his horror, the duck fell dead. The boy panicked, and in desperation, he took the dead duck, and he hid it in the woodpile. And then he saw his sister Sally, it's early this morning, sister Sally standing by the corner of the house. She had seen the whole thing, and they went into lunch, and Sally said nothing. And after his lunch uh, lunchtime, his grandmother said, okay, Sally, let's clear the table and wash the dishes. And Sally said, oh, grandmother. Johnny said he wanted to help you in the kitchen today. <laughs> Didn't you, Johnny? And then she whispered to him, remember the duck. <laughs> so Johnny did the dishes. Later in the day, his grandfather called the children to go fishing. And grandmother said, I'm sorry, but Sally can't go. She has to stay here and help me clean the house and get supper. And Sally smiled. And she said, that's all been taken care of. Johnny wanted to help today, didn't you, Johnny? And then she re whispered, remember the duck. <laughs> that probably just really freaked out all the people that are online. I don't know what that's doing to them, but 
This went on for several days, and Johnny did all the chores, all of his and all of Sally's chores. And finally, he couldn't stand it any longer, and she took him in her, the grandmother couldn't stand it any longer, and so he went to his grandmother, and he confessed it all, and she took him in her arms and said, I know, Johnny. I was standing at the kitchen window, and I saw the whole thing. And because I love you, I forgave you, and knowing that I loved you and would always forgive you, I wondered just how long it would take as you let Sally make a slave out of you. Hey, folks, God's calling to your heart today. He's just saying very seriously, all the excuses and all the things you've done to cover up your sin, it's time to confess it. If we don't confess our sin, we become slaves to guilt, and there's no need to do that. The Lord is gracious and compassionate and ready to forgive our sins. In His righteousness, He may deal with us severely, even after He's forgiven us. But we can trust that he always, always has our ultimate good in mind. Do you trust that? Romans 8.28 says, All things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. So we can submit to him and worship him even when he sends affliction into our lives. We want to invite you to do that today as we come together and worship. In fact, in the next few moments, we're going to sing some worship songs, and this is going to rock your world, okay? But it's okay. In the next few moments, we're going to sing some worship songs, and anytime that you're ready, we invite you to come, come and move out of your spot. Come grab communion from here. Wasn't that mean that we didn't let you take it as you came in today and stuff it in your pocket and do it on your own terms and your own time? You weren't able to hide that little cup or four or five of them for a snack later in your pocket? Don't smile too big. I know you did it. But we want to invite you very simply to come right now in an honest way. In an honest way. You don't have to stand before the congregation and confess your sin today, but, but you need to move from your spot and really ask yourself the question, <sighs> Do I trust Jesus enough to let him deal with my sin? That's what this is about. So there's nothing prescribed here. We're going to sing some worship songs. And as, as you feel called, we invite you to come forward and do some business with Jesus. Examine yourself today. Don't just talk about it. Do it. Come before the Lord and worship him. For he's the one who's dealt with your sin. Will you submit to him? Let's sing together this morning. regrets and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling oh come to the altar
It's your prayer. Boy, that was different, wasn't it? I hope uh, hope you catch the spirit of sometimes uh, not doing the same things the same way and expecting different results. That's what God leads us to in our lives. Now we got some uh, got some announcements to share with you. Eddie, you gonna come up here and help me out with this today? <laughs> he had that look on his face like, I guess I will. <laughs> so uh, we talked about doing this later on in the week just to. Helping us, uh, help us out. And this is kind of a reminder to you. Um, you know, do you, do you appreciate the spring in Eddie's step as he comes up here? He's cleaning house. He's doing all sorts of great stuff while we come up today. Uh, next week, Eddie, uh, next week, Megan will remind you this, I'm sure. But set your clock, set your clock an hour ahead so you're at church on time, okay, next week? Okay. okay. I won't. You won't, but somebody will? Okay. Breakfast or dinner? Do you like breakfast or dinner? I don't know what I'm supposed to say. Do you have breakfast? <laughs> you didn't even get a chance to answer that. Do you guys like breakfast for supper? Okay, okay. <laughs> See, he knew. He knew. He just, he just knew. Uh, March 19th, that's at 6 p.m. Uh, come here to the church. We're going to have breakfast for dinner. Uh, we're going to have a bunch of games. It's going to be March Gladness. Um, so yeah, we're going to need some time. people to do some cooking. If, you, if you'd like to help cook, um, come see me. If you'd like to help cook, we're going to have, you know, pancakes and ham and eggs and all that kind of good breakfast food. Probably some sweet rolls that night too. Uh, praise God for for Angie Baumfalk and and several of the other Vera, Vera. And where's Deb Gray? Somebody call Deb Gray up. Tell her too. Uh, we got some <laughs> wonderful sweet roll makers. And if I missed you, just bring them anyways and, and impress the rest of the crowd because uh, they're awesome. Uh, lots of good stuff coming there. Um, and we'll have a great night of fellowship. It's just kind of a time to get together in fellowship. Um, also, 
Um, we're looking for people to uh, start some fires. That sounds scary because I read on the High V sign that there's a burn ban in Clark County. And uh, we're not talking about literal fires. We're talking about catalyst people to help out um, get some small groups started. We've got a great study, and uh, Eddie's going to tell you a little bit about the study we're going to share. Yeah. Uh, Matt Chandler's got this study called To Live as Christ and To Die as Gain, and we basically are going to walk through the book of Philippians. Um, great study. Matt Chandler really, uh, he brings the heat, uh, and he challenges you. Uh, I love the study. I've done it multiple times. Um, some of you that have hung out with us before, Seth, we all, we've done it before. Super awesome study. Uh, get involved with it. You will be challenged to grow, um, and that's exactly what we want to do. We're going to be kicking this off in a couple of weeks, and so we need some people, um, and I, we're not looking for people that are great teachers or anything. We need some people just say that, hey, I like other people, and I'll, I'm willing to open up my home for a small group study. Um, all, the, all the materials are already online on our church website, so it's really easy to get at. We need some people to just kind of be catalysts for those groups. So um, if, if you are the type of person that uh, enjoys being a host or a hostess or maybe both of those things, um, get a group started. If you're a person that just says, hey, I want to meet some new people in our church, get a group started. And, and it's a dynamic way just to help out. The teaching is provided there in video segments. And then there's just some discussion time and fellowship time following. And, and I guarantee it'll be a time of blessing for you. Get involved. Get involved and uh, get involved in one of these groups and get started. We're starting in a couple of weeks, okay? Um, so, And we're going to have a, a quick meeting. Anybody interested in being one of these fire starter types of people? Uh, March 16th at 7 p.m., uh, we're going we're gonna to kind of walk you through uh, just kind of a training. And, and uh, so begin getting a group of people together, and maybe some people you don't know, maybe a couple of people you do know, and let's target some folks around to get involved in this and share as small groups as, as our church too. Um, the other thing is ladies' night out. That's going to be fun. And that lets us off the hook. <laughs> that's, yeah. Yeah. that's the 25th at 6 p.m. Yeah. And what do you think they're going to do, Eddie? Um, they're going to the Mexican restaurant. They're going to, I don't know. Well, what else do you think they're going to do, Eddie? Girl stuff. Okay, What girl do girls stuff. do on yeah, a night right, out? That's good. So, yeah, so if you want to, if you want to, uh, our ladies' night out group is, is meeting, and they just go out and do, like Eddie said, girl, girl stuff. I don't know what that is either, but you all enjoy it. Um, and so, uh, what it, <laughs> um, food pantry is going super well. It's going to bless the ministry. Uh, there's some things in here that you could help contribute if you want to contribute to that ministry. But also, we want to let you know that we're looking for uh, a few people to take on a flooring project. Uh, we got a, uh, a wonderful, wonderful blessing in terms of a donation to the food pantry. And uh, we need to get some crisp, clean flooring in there. And if anybody has uh, a few hours on a day to tear out some carpet and maybe uh, bless the food pantry, uh, we'd love to come alongside you and make that flooring project a reality in there. Uh, that, that's been a blessing to, to many. And so if you want to participate in that way and you're, and you're good at flooring, if nothing else, it'll get you down on your hands and knees. Good prayer time, right? So uh, come and, and be involved in that. Otherwise, all sorts of good stuff going on throughout the week. Uh, we've wrapped up our, our, um, our evening Bible studies, but we do have uh, an adult Bible study this Wednesday here at the church. And uh, if you have missed all the Bible studies before, this is the one to come to. We're doing a one-week study on the book of Jude, one chapter. You can jump into that one, all right? So help out with that one, get back in. Um, several prayer requests as well. We, we talked about uh, praying for our brothers and sisters in, in Ukraine. Pray for all the Christians in Russia, too, and that, uh, that folks will rise up and be a light. Um, Sally Phillips is going to be going in for a back procedure. Did it? Done it? Did it over good. Wow. Man, and she's here today, and, and she brought Wayne with her. What a blessing. Um, so uh, glad to see your smiling face, Sally. Uh, also, uh, Tim Cool is going through some chemo and radi radiation. And uh, I want to keep Charles in prayer. This is uh, Phyllis Poisington's brother. And how's he doing? Okay. So praying for God's mercy and grace right now. Um, they're, they're, um, they're waiting 
for God to answer in this situation. So pray for Phyllis and her family in that as well. Uh, also for Nick Miller, Sherry Munch, um, prayer, prayers for Loretta Eccles who fell and broke a bone in her. Uh, excuse me. Thank you. Loretta Rees uh, fell and broke a bone um, in a lower hip and she's in the hospital recovering. Pray for all of uh, our friends and neighbors in the intercept too, Bob. Okay, used to be Carol Fuller, uh, Bob Fuller's daughter. Um, they had some major damage on their house up in Pleasant Hill. So all the people that are affected by the storm, keep praying for that as well. Other prayer requests today. Okay. Yeah, I've been praying for Patricia Snyder through our church, and she got news that she is cancer-free at this point in time. So praise God for that. And uh, just glad for her as well. Okay, Jolene Schwery, pray for her. And uh, uh, just got news that her cancer has returned. So pray for the doctors as they guide Carrie on that as well. Okay, others? Well, let's close in prayer. Father, we do lift those um, on our request list up to you, Father, and those mentioned today. Uh, Lord, we trust you in all things. We know that you're good. Father, even when we don't understand. Uh, but Lord, I just pray uh, that we would take your message today, Father, and we would apply it to our lives, take it to the world. Thank you so much for your son, Jesus, and the hope that we have, the forgiveness that we have, Father. Um, help us today to be broken over our sin, uh, just to come to you, uh, and seeking that forgiveness in which we can find in, in Jesus. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Stick around for Sunday school. We'll see you soon.